Hi, Gita. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Sound check? Good? Yeah, sound check done. Looking good, forward good, to the good. show tonight. Yeah, yeah. We're at the Jazz Cafe in um, London Town. Yeah. Fresh from Lisbon, promoting the new album. Yeah, Atlas. Okay, so um, for people who don't know much about Jazzino, let's do, let's just have a quick recap on the first album that came, you know, when it came through, was released in Japan, if I remember right, before anywhere else. And that was where, in a way, that was quite interesting because the buzz suddenly came from Japan about the album. It came into the kind of new jazz scene through, I suppose, in Japan through people like the Akino Brothers and the Kyoto Jazz Massif and people like that. And then came into kind of Britain and therefore Europe with people like Giles Peterson. Could you say a little bit about the first album? What were your aims around that? Yes, the first Jazzinho album was an album which was very much sort of studio produced. So, um, first of all, we did the demos uh, with this wonderful multi-instrumentist called Michele Chiavarini from Italy. And uh, we did them in Acne, in this small studio. Um, it was like gangster wars going on and everything. And we were in our little bubble doing our music. Then, with that, we got financed to do the album by an Austrian label, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. And, um, and then it went to Japan. It went to Japan, was uh, released there through Rip Curl. Um, I had collaborated with uh, Kyoto Jazz Massive, the Okino Brothers. Um, they did a remix, Sleepwalker, right. um, with Hajime Yoshizawa, yeah, which is a wonderful pianist. Great, yeah. and, uh, but basically, the first album was very much programmed studio driven the voices all the harmonies were already there which we kept as an element of that first album and brought into the second album oh, okay so when did you start work on the second album atlas when did you start on that um sort of bit by bit really you know i just had sort of strands of melodies of uh, uh, bits and pieces of structures and i got the inspiration mostly i would say by uh, Maybe it will sound like a cliche, but by the global situation mm -hmm. at the moment. So um, it was a much more sort of a contrasted album, much more sort of live energy, raw. Um, that's what I wanted to, uh, to get through. Um, and that's why we did a sort of live in studio right, in London. Right, right. In fact, you know, you said that it was kind of um, conditioned by what was going on in the world around you. I mean, you, you just finished the sound check in the last piece you did and the sound check was a piece with just yourself and the flautist who was playing guitar. Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that track because very relevant. Yes, that track was a, a really emotional and strong moment. Uh, it was at the time of the uh, Katrina storm in New Orleans and um, I just had seen this segment on television uh, about this guy holding on to his wife's hand and at some point she just told him I can't hold on anymore to you. Um, just look after the kids. I love you. I love you. And these were the last words that she said to him. And that's what he was in his despair, was screaming out to the camera so that, you know, he was just screaming out his despair. And that was really strong. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, this has come out. And I just couldn't sleep and tight came out. Okay. Yeah, that's very, that's a serious, serious yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, um, one of one of the um, one of the you know one of the things that's quite distinctive about this album is that you've enlisted the support of your compadre from uh, Rio de Janeiro, Edi Mota, good friend, straight no chaser. He's a man who's kind of steeped in the sort of jazz tradition, as well as obviously his own sort of you know Brazilian musical traditions. So, um, when did you decide you wanted to get Ed involved? Ah, you know, this is another gift from God. Uh, one day at home I received an email. I had seen Ed many times beforehand here at the Jazz Cafe uh, and listened to his records, um, but I'd never said hello, I'd never been introduced. And I received this email saying, I love your album, this is for the first album, Edge Mortar, everything is wonderful. Da, 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 da. And I was like, my God, Edge Morta, without knowing me, sent me an email oh, okay. saying all those good things about my first album. And that lasted with me for quite a while. I felt good for quite a while, you know. And then I just thought, Ed, please, let's write a tune together. 
I'm sure we've got many things in common. So and so we wrote Symmetry, oh, okay. which is on the new album Atlas. And Symmetry is about him being in Brazil, me being on the other side of the Atlantic, but still having a lot in common. So almost like a mirror right, image, right, you right, know. Right. Um, so, but we wrote that first tune <clears throat> together, and afterwards. Um, I just thought, and what if I asked him to come and produce the album? I had nothing to lose. I asked him. I sent him the demos. He loved it. He said yes. He came, and the magic began. Because mm -hmm. the thing about the thing about yourself and Ed is you're both quite eclectic, aren't you? I mean, that's that's one of the, you know the things about it. You know, you could you're not sort of traditional. And you know you've got a lot of twists and turns to to your music, and Ed is obviously the same. I mean, he's a fonquero I mean, on the one hand, and he's a kind yeah. of jazzero you know, on the other yeah, one. You know, so he's got uh, those element, you know, those different elements. So the yeah. two of you, I think, as a kind of, you know, it's uh, quite, you know, there's a bit of a catalyst going on between you, you know. Yeah. So how did you work it in the studio? How you know between you? How did how did you kind of approach working together in the studio? Because like you said, this album. Is a, is a kind of live in the studio album. So yeah. how, how did you kind of approach that? Well, obviously, we had written, uh, I had written most of the tunes with uh, Marcelo and with uh, Guy Tavares, Marcelo Andrade and Guy Tavares. Um, and we structured those at home at my place. And regularly with the band, we would rehearse them live in my living room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, when we were happy with the tunes, and we thought that we had taken them, you know, as far as, as we could. Then I sent them to Ed. Ed listened to that. He came and he added on even more ideas. He took it even, you know, a level further. He would sing, like, in, for instance, bass lines. Oh, okay. He would sing bass lines or he would sing uh, the brass lines. And so the guys afterwards would arrange it. You know, so that the section would come and play. Because yeah, uh, he's amazing at doing that, isn't he? That's yeah. the thing. When you did, when uh, they did that spontaneous kind of gig at um, Cargo. Yeah. And he was doing that because he had a lot of brass players there. We'd never really played with, and he would just sing all the brass lines to them, and then they would sort of play it all back. Yeah, 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 definitely. So you get you, know, so you, I suppose you get a kind of real spontaneity in the yeah. studio yeah. in terms of exactly, that. Yeah. exactly. That's exactly how it was. So because the guys knew all the tunes and had on top of it these new grooves that them, being musicians, loved. Right. Because right, right. everybody kept an open mind, you know, about things. It was just great to be in the studio. And then we had also Hamish Stewart. I mean, I had written this other tune with, with him about the children of Angola, Nino uh, Giangola. And uh, he was there too, doing like, great guitars. Um, Jim Mullen came, yeah, yeah. did great solos on Look Inside. Um, and Max Middleton came, he played clavinet. That was fantastic too, you know. <laughs> for anyone who remembers Jeff Beck, yeah. you know, so uh, it was great, and all the rest of the musicians, Dudu Tavares on drums, Nick Franz also on drums, uh, Mateus Novo on bass. Really, Mateus would like reproduce straight away what Ed would tell him, on when he had like a new groove idea. Right. It was a good, uh, it's a fantastic bass player. Um, then Anselm Net from Bahia on mandolin. So you mentioned all the guys in the band. So I mean, in, in a way, you, it sounds like you you had a real vibing musicians thing going on. Yeah. In the premises, is that where it was? <laughs> Close to the premises. Close to the premises. It was the Fortress Studio. Ah, Fortress Studio. Yeah, okay, yeah. A bit better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> premises was great too. Yeah, actually, yeah, it was yeah. a friend of mine, Dil Katz, that used to uh, yeah. have the studio at the premises. But he lost money, like you know most people do uh, yeah, in the yeah, music yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, at the Fortress Studio, another thing that helped the vibe was that they had like lots of vintage keyboards. Oh, right, right, right. And right, they right, had right. like Selena, they had B3, Fender Rhodes, Clavinet. It was just like heaven. Oh, okay, know? so Ed would have loved that. Oh, he loved it. He tried every single one of them. We used every single one of them. Yeah, yeah. And then also there was this huge live cabin where you could get like a rhythm section well obviously the bass in a separate thing and uh, you know mm -hmm. the drums but there was enough space for loads of people to play together oh, okay. so that helped the spontaneity so 
So, yeah. so in a way, you, you, you know, you, you, it's a kind of bit more of an original recording kind of vibe. You know, totally. sort of 70s, sort of 60s, 70s totally. recording vibe. That's the vibe. Even the desk um, was an Eve. Oh, okay. The best, the best, the best British yeah. thing, mate. Yeah, an Eve. So, and, and obviously one of the things that both you and, and Ed are kind of, um, that you're both into um, Steely Dan. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so I mean, it's that kind of thing of you know sound, yeah. you know, in, in relation to that kind of recording. Yes, yes. yes so yes. tell us a little bit about you know the, the sort of yes. that kind of the Steely Dan sheen type yes, of thing. Yes, yes. Well, that Steely Dan thing, it was the the recording and obviously everything that we used to make that recording, all the ingredients, or should I say, all the instruments kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there was like a a, a, a drum kit that we used, which was, you know, the drum kit that Silly Dan used to use. Then, uh, obviously, the mics for the voice, and then the, the mic technique, the, the, the harmonic technique, right. which was sort of, I would say, 240 degree uh -huh. technique, whereby you get, like, many layers of different harmonies, yeah, double and treble, those right, harmonies, right. yes? And you sort of go all throughout the spectrum and that's quite different from the first album, I think, in terms of the vocal sound. Yes, the vocal sound was a bit different. Mm. The harmonic work was the same, but uh, this vocal sound was more natural, whereas the other one had sort of processing enhances, things right, that right, we right. use now. Uh, in the second album, with, in the Atlas one, uh, we didn't use any compression. So it was, as you say, sort of 60s mm, style. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and then, yes, all the vintage keyboards you know that's very stilly danish too yeah. um and then the neve and the, the avalon you know it's uh it was all very um warm yeah very warm all the uh, odd frequencies they say were announced <laughs> so that's good because you're quite hands-on yourself as uh, you know you like you, you were saying earlier that you know you've done you know production yourself and you're not going to relinquish production to someone to take it, you know, away from you, so you're quite hands-on yourself. Yes, because it's just a pleasure, I mean, you know, it's your baby. Mm. It's, you know, you, you've written the music, you've, you know, co-arranged the music, you've practiced the music, you want to be there at every yeah. stage, so yeah. that's yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, well that makes complete sense. Yeah. So once the album, so the album's done, and it's kind of, you're here in London to kind of, to launch it tonight, yeah. and it's on freestyle, which yeah. is um, Adrian Gibson and yeah. what's he called? The other guy that plays. Uh, Danny Adrian. Ryan. Danny Ryan, yeah. yeah. And um, and that's pretty much home. Jazz Cafe is pretty much home for Adrian. Yeah. And uh, it's quite interesting also that, it's, it, that his label, Freestyle as well, is a label which has got that kind of very organic kind of feel to it in terms of, you know, the other people that are on the label. It's yeah. funky. Yeah. It's kind of very street orientated. Yeah. So, you know, is that a good home, yeah. you know, for you in the UK? No, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with them. And uh, obviously, you know, I love Adrian because he's got the Jazz Cafe. He's been here, you know, for quite a while. And uh, he helps spreading the good vibe, you know, the good music that is so important, yeah, you know. Yeah. And is, uh, you know, a true, you know, a true guy. Yeah, music lover, yeah. yeah music lover. Music lover yeah. So, um, and the same at the uh, Freestyle, all the Freestyle crew. So, uh, yeah, hopefully. So how do you see it now? I mean, basically, as you said, the recording was live. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've come through a kind of era where the whole, you know, the whole kind of music scene has been pretty much dominated by DJ-orientated sessions. <laughs> and you know what's interesting, you know what's interesting about the side of the scene that in a way that we kind of represent with Straight No Chaser, and and is that it's a, it's always been a combination of the DJ side of the music and the live side. You know, I mean, how how do you see now? You know, in the in the coming period, you know, for you for yourself and Jazzino, where 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 do you want to kind of focus your kind of uh, your mission? You know, is it in terms of the live sessions that you're planning to do? 
getting into the kind of jazz festivals in Europe in the summer. You've you know. said it. <laughs> That's yeah. the thing, isn't it? It's getting to uh, the circuit of good jazz festivals or good world music festivals and because it's true, our music crosses over. Yeah. You know, it's a bit funk, it's jazz, it's world. Uh, so yeah, do festivals, spread the vibe. Uh, also, we've just had a remix done by Nicola Conte. Okay. So, you know, sort of the DJs also have something from Jazine that they can use, you know, yeah. in, their, in their sets. But definitely, um, yes, life for me is a very special moment. It's a very magic moment, and uh, I would love to do much more of that. And the live side is where, in a way, you get those magic moments, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, when you write a song, when you have the inspiration and it comes, and it, that's great, that's a great feeling too. Um, but when you are live on stage, you interact with the audience, and in a way, uh, and so it's like making sex, that sounds like really cheesy and cliche, but, you know, it's very pleasurable. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, at the moment, you are living back in Lisbon. Yeah. You know, back in back in the home territory. Yeah. And you're saying there's a lot of Brazilians there, and there's sort of there's a bit of a the vibe has kind of opened up for you for your music in a kind of slightly different way. Yeah, yeah. The thing is that Portugal uh, had been sort of under a dictatorship, so very right wing for a very long time, and then by the end of the 70s, sort of opened. And then people from Brazil, from the former colonies, mm -hmm. Angola, Angola, Mozambique, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Guinea, uh, they all came back. And nowadays, if you go to Lisbon, it's a very tropical city in Europe. Oh, okay. Because you know, you've got all these different communities that are united by the fact that they all speak Portuguese. Right. And so all that enriches not only, I would say, the oral culture, but also the society at every level. Mm -hmm. And it, it transfers it to music too. So uh, you have lots of good music now in Portugal. Yeah, so you have so. your traditional fado is channeled through Cape Verdean singers and yes. you know stuff like that. And rappers, it? Portuguese rappers. Uh, yeah, apparently the Angolan, um, there's, a new, uh, there's a whole Angolan rap scene which apparently is really kicking off. Yeah, with melody. Apparently, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have wonderful um, jazz musicians too. Yeah, you know, yeah. you have Maria João, Mario Lajinha, Bernardo Sasset, Ricardo Dias, Sara Tavares, great. Sara Tavares, yeah. Marisa on the yeah, yeah, yeah. more traditional but a new view of fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great yeah. people. So you've got a good, you, there's a good community working there. Yeah. So from there, is there any plans to do Brazil? Oh, Any Brazilian I would promoters love out there? To do Brazil. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll invite you guys over. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, come. We're ready. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in Lisbon is coming out with Universal in Portugal, so hopefully, you yeah. know. And I love the crew there. I've got you know very good label with uh, Paulo Show and uh, Tose Brito. So you know, hopefully, we'll get the music out there and it will cross the ocean and uh, we'll go to the other side. Great. Okay. Take a call. Are we cool? Yeah. <laughs>